Go ahead, Kim Marie. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you, EA Zoom Meetings, for allowing me to speak with all of you today. We're going to have an exciting two hours. We're going to look at the cycle of phases and aspects. It is something that has been germane to evolutionary astrology from its very beginnings. And as I've worked in EA for 30 plus years, I've watched over time how even general astrology has started to look at aspects from the 0 to 360 circle, which is what we're going to explain today. In other words, general astrology is even learning that there's a difference between a first quarter square and a last quarter square. So we have a lot of information to go through today. If you have any questions, I'm always welcome to take them. Um, someone who um, is hosting can is welcome to interrupt me. And uh, if you have a question, I, I'll be happy to answer it as best as I can. All right. Now, most of us uh, come to the cycle of phases and aspects from looking at the phases of the sun and the moon. You can see a visual of that on your screen here as we look at the cycle that sun and moon go through. In evolutionary astrology, we use this cycle with every single planet. And here is the example again for you. This is something that originally came from Dane Rudier in his book, The Lunation Cycle. And he spoke about these eight phases specific to the sun and the moon. And then Jeffrey Green followed up on what he brought forth and came up with what you see on your screen right here. And this is how we look at it from, again, the perspective of any two planets or any planet and point in space. Now, I'm going to try and give you eight examples, one in each of these eight phases as we work our way through this this afternoon. We're going to use one chart to make it more uh, simple and easier to just build upon the different phases and aspects when we're looking at a single chart. It allows us to um, condense the time, so to speak, okay? Um, I actually have taught this in a 10-hour series of webinar yeah series of webinars i guess that's how you say it so i'm going to try and take that 10 hours down into two so bear with me if i speak fast i will not go into detail with the map i will show you visually if you are interested in a longer term version of this you can always contact us and i'll have um, the contact information towards the end of this PowerPoint presentation. Now, here is a listing for you just as you um, go through and watch this webinar in the future. I've just taken all four of these eight phases, 360 degrees divided by eight comes up to 45 degrees for each phase. So it's kind of like each phase has a sign and a half in it and you'll start to get the hang of that as um, we go through and look at each of these individual phases. We won't be able to do every aspect. Again, it just there's a limitation of time here, but I did a combination of example with phase and examine an example with aspect. So you get multiple uh, variations in looking at this. First of all, just a couple of basics for you. If you've been studying evolutionary astrology for any length of time, you know that it is based upon observe and correlate. One of the worst things an astrologer can do is make an assumption and project that out there onto the chart. In the world of EA, we are always working with the Q&A, the interaction back and forth with, it, with whatever chart is in question and what we're looking at. And so we actually have um, um, someone who is live on this webinar, and I'd like to say thank you, Anya, ahead of time, and thank you for staying up over there in Europe to um, be our example. And um, Anya, I'll do a lot of talking. I'll try to make sure that I stop and ask if you have any questions. By all means, Anya, you are always welcome to interrupt me about anything with your chart that you either don't understand or you'd like to add some detail or you have a question. Please feel free to interrupt, interact with me however it works for you, okay? Now, 
evolutionary under, uh, astrology understands that a planet, a sign, and a house are all based upon the same archetypical principles. For instance, Mars, with its rulership of Aries in the first house, Mars, Aries, first house, they are all one archetype, and they have a variety of principles within that archetype. Same thing with Venus and its inner Venus with its rulership of Taurus in the second house. And so the planet, the sign, the house, all the same. We also understand that when you start at the beginning of astrology, Jeffrey Green always used to say, the basic thing that you start with is learning the 12 archetypes. If you learn Aries through Pisces, you know the first house through the 12th. And then you know all the planets that go along with that rulership. That helps simplify that rather than trying to say, oh my gosh, the planet, the sign, the house. And a lot of general astrology would like to say there's a difference between a sign and a house and you can just get into overwhelm so easily. So remember this little principle right here. And then once you learn those 12 archetypes, when you learn the cycle of phases and aspects from 0 to 360, that helps put it all together with planet signs and houses so that you can learn how to integrate and interpret any astrological components in a chart. And so again, this is a lot of what we're going to uh, work with and, and explore. Now, in general, when we look at the cycle of phases and aspects, life or us souls we're always in a state of continuous change and evolution and we know that by the way we initiate through that archetype of mars aries first house as we have these spontaneous desires come up and we want to start initiating and acting upon them well there's archetypes that come after that initiation but again this whole cycle of the circle it from zero to 360 it's birth growth bloom decay and death and then we start all over again and then we start all over again now one of the things that i had to train myself to do was say phases first and aspects second especially because i have been teaching it so every point or planet is in a phasal relationship to every other point and planet in your chart you can Look at your own chart forever if you want to look at every single point or planet and, and compare it to where it is phasally with every other one. Luckily, we have astrological programs where you can actually get them to put that information out there for you so that you don't have to do the math. And then you can look at what's the phasal relationship between my Venus and Saturn and how I um, achieve self-responsibility based upon what I value etc etc now every planet and point doesn't always have an aspect between them there's always a phase there may or may not be an aspect and I like to say when you start to interpret aspects you start with the phase first and then fill in the aspect because the aspects are contained within the phase got that Phase first, then you fill in the details of the aspect when you're looking at an aspect between any two planets. All right? Now, there's always three reactions to the evolutionary impulse. We can resist it. Uh-uh, don't want to go there. Typically, that means there's something that is threatening security in some way or bringing up fear in some way, fear of that unknown. Secondly, we can just totally go for the change, jump in all the way and see what we can do differently than what we've done before. And then the third reaction is where we're willing to change in some ways and we're resistant in other ways. And this third reaction to change a little, resist a little, is by far the most common reaction that all of us have. We'll kind of explore with this and perhaps as we're going back and forth with some of our specific examples, um, our volunteer can show us um, 
point out maybe where she might fear she's in resistance or maybe going forward or bouncing back and forth with it. Now, briefly, here's how we determine aspects to planets when we're working with it zero to 360 degrees. Faster moving planet, always compared to the slower moving planet in a counterclockwise fashion. The planets reverse going counterclockwise through the zodiac and through the houses. So here's some examples for you. First example, Mercury to Pluto. Pluto's the slower moving planet between the two. So here's Pluto with this green um, line right here. And we would have to follow this inner green circle all the way around to get to Mercury. So Mercury is making a balsamic phase conjunction, and it's an aspect to Pluto. Let's look at Venus and Pluto. Pluto, again, is going to be the slower moving planet. Here we are extrapolating it out to this green line. We only have to go about 11 degrees to get to Venus. And why EA uses wide orbs for me, after I get about past 10 degrees, I consider it to be a phase. So Venus here in this example, Venus's new phase, Pluto, and it's moved beyond an aspect. Now, in Jeffrey Green's teachings, he would always say that we compare every planet to the sun because it is the center of the solar system. It is the life-giving force. Mm. Several years ago, I heard another astrologer, Laura Nelbandian, um, kind of shift in regards to the sun. And as I've worked with forecasting astrology over the years, I've kind of shifted this myself. And so I just want to point out that as I'm using this example here, it has kind of um, evolved, let's use that word, from some of Jeffrey Green's original teachings. We live in a geocentric universe, geocentric meaning Earth-centered. And so as I've worked with some of those fast-moving transits from planet to planet in the sky, I started comparing the inner planets, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, to the Sun. And I compare the Sun to the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, include Chiron, on out. All right? So, using that for an example with you, I would compare the Sun to Saturn. And so, in this same chart here, I here's Saturn, green line. I would follow the outer circle all the way around, all right? And the Sun is balsamic phase to Saturn. It's 13 degrees before a conjunction, so I don't consider it to be in a conjunction. I consider it to be within the balsamic phase. Now, this is how I shall use the examples in um, this webinar today. You need to do whatever feels best for you. Just like evolutionary astrology works with any type of house system, you know, as many evolutionary astrologers have moved forward over the last three, four decades, you now some of us start to have little variations to some of the original teachings by Jeffrey Green. Here again is your example. And right here in this uh, screen that you, or in the slide you see on your screen right now, we're going to just jump right into the new phase, which goes from zero to 45 degrees. As you can see right here in the inner circle, these phases alternate between yang and yin. Yang, energy moving out from the center. Yin, energy moving back into the center. The key word we've used for new phase is the instinctual emergence. So, what happens when any two planets are in a new phase to each other between 0 and 45 degrees? There is a brand new evolutionary intention that is being born and initiated 
between these two planets or between a planet and a point. And I do have some specific example with um, the nodal axis for you as we go through this 360 degree cycle of the phases. But again, what happens from the new conjunction, there just needs to be this intense spontaneity and freedom to go in any random uh, direction. In other words, that yang energy moving out, we have an action and then there is a reaction. There's not that forethought or foresight when we're in that new phase conjunction aspect. As we start to see the planets separate from each other going into 15, 20, 30, 40 degrees, then we start to get more and more knowledge and eventually that random energy moving outward starts to slow down, condense, starts to get a little bit more and a little bit more of forethought going into the new action. In other words, we start to get better at recognizing from any reactions to anything we make that, wait a minute, I don't think I want to do that one anymore. I think I know I want to go in a certain direction forward. But the whole thing about new phase is that there is this strong, strong energy to bust out and break free from whatever came before. We want to separate from the past. And of course, when we're close into a new phase conjunction aspect, there can be some pull from that past. We remember it. It represents that security. So it sometimes is hard to break free. Sometimes they want to go back to that past. And yet we also don't want to be absorbed by it because it's that been there, done that. Yes, it's secure, but oh man, it just doesn't do anything for me anymore. I want to keep going forward. Now, anytime you're looking at any one of the phases, just like when you're looking at the 12 archetypes, to have a full understanding of one of those 12 archetypes, you look to the opposite archetype and you see the polarities as they exist. Gemini Sag are as a polarity. You understand Gemini better from its Sag polarity. You understand Sag better from the Gemini polarity. Same thing will act with the phases. And so the opposite phase of new phase is, of course, the full phase. And full phase is, again, how we get that feedback to all of those actions that we're going out there and initiating between any two planets when they're in that new phase or new conjunction. What can happen here is we can begin to think that someone else or something else knows better. It's so new, we don't have a lot of experience built up. So sometimes we may borrow from the other we may take them in and they can start to have influence on that new phase. When that happens, there can be a tendency to sooner or later experience frustration because of that need to have our own freedom to see where the journey or adventure goes. And so eventually, even though we need that feedback from someone or something, the universe coming at us, eventually we start to learn how in new phase to trust that intuition with inside ourself as much as the feedback that is coming from that polarity full phase. Now, again, there's a lot of detail that we can come through with all of the aspects through the new phase. Um, for sake of time, we're just going to have one example with each one of these phases. And I'm just going to start to check my time a little bit for us so that I can um, do my best to, to stay on time for us. So let's jump right in. 
Okay, here is our um, example and what I did is I put the environmental conditionings right there on the screen for you. Um, this was someone who was raised pretty much outdoors in nature, um, was raised in Norway, so they're a pretty social democratic country, raised middle class, mother was practical, sometimes a bit cold, father was intelligent, sometimes a bit aloof though. Um, she was raised, though, to learn and explore. She didn't get a lot of heavy conditioning into thou shalt do this or not do that. So there wasn't a lot of heavy religious conditioning. As a matter of fact, her father was critical of Christianity. Um, somewhere along early on, she got involved with Share International. I don't know a lot of details. I've heard, and I may mispronounce it. I'm very right brain. I don't pronounce where it's good. Okay, Matraya, Matreya. I have a, I have a um, good girlfriend who um, is um, has followed him for years. So I pick up bits and pieces on it. But Anya, you're welcome to say things as we go along and especially when we get to balsamic phase because this is the balsamic phase example right here, honey. So you can bring us in some details on that. Um, since 2012, she's been very actively involved in UBI, which is Universal Basic Income, which by the way, on uh, is I, I think that's okay to say your name. Apologies if it's not. Um, it's one of my pet passions as well. I love this. And this is basically coming from in the broadest concepts that as everything gets roboticized and robots do the work of humans, and as we move into this Aquarian age with more and more artificial intelligence, there are less and less jobs for human. So there's this growing movement across planet Earth whereby that we find a way, local, national, at some day in the Aquarian age, it'll be global, where there's a basic income to just provide for food, clothing, and shelter. And it allows a human to free up and be creative. So pay attention to this. You will hear more and more and more about UBI. Um, Canada is, I think, got three cities in Ontario where they're um, exploring it. The United States, there's a lot of um, your West Coast and, and Southwest areas that are starting to look at it. Um, this volunteer has a lot of history in social activism in all kinds of various ways. By the way, I have some of that same. She's done a lot of traveling. She eventually got a college degree at one point. She was a dog trainer, loved it. Lots of difficulty in intimate relationships, experienced a rape at 17. It led to, I would say, kind of almost being out of her body and a lot of... Um, promiscuity. And she also then had a, a short, intense relationship that was quite abusive with um, an Eastern Indian businessman when um, she was in Dubai. Various relationships after that, but along that journey and coming from this um, Dubai relationship, learning how to stand up for her, herself and learning how to stand up for her needs. Eighth house, Pluto, Scorpio, soul, learning to affect the self-reliance, evolutionary intent. Um, currently, she says she feels that she would label herself more androgynous um, in her world. So, as a new phase example, I thought I would just start with Pluto, the soul. We're evolutionary astrology here. She's the Pluto and Virgo generation which is a generation of souls that are really going through ah, Jeffrey's words were the humiliation. We're going through getting off of the top of the pyramid. We're learning how to be of service to ourselves, to others, to the universe. We're learning how to make those adjustments in order to get along with the world. Pluto and Virgos have that Piscean polarity point. I always say this generation goes through a disenchantment with beliefs 
And it's why we've seen so many of our religions decline because this generation goes, wait a minute, I can't buy into these distortions of the patriarchy anymore. And yet with the Pisces polarity, they're meant to rebirth and specifically this generation. They're meant to rebirth their belief systems, moving more and more and more towards natural spiritual principles or what EA calls natural law. Everybody born on planet Earth either has Uranus last quarter balsamic phase Pluto or new first quarter phase Pluto. Right now, what do we have? Souls coming in that are just having Uranus, what, 95 degrees beyond Pluto right now? So we have everybody alive on planet Earth with some, you know, some relationship of Uranus Pluto and a lot of us having it fairly close probably everybody on this phone call is going to be within balsamic phase new phase in regards to your Uranus Pluto relationship so Uranus is um, right now about um, what is it 12 and a half degrees beyond Pluto so it's beyond the conjunction here it's new phase Pluto's the slower moving planet you go counterclockwise through the signs through the houses till you get to Uranus 12 degrees beyond well it's the same house we have a change in the signs what happens so many times with an eighth house Pluto Yes, everybody they have an intimate relationship with, they probably knew more or less intimately. Sometimes Pluto Virgos can go through some relationship abuse, especially if they have fallen into a fair amount of conditioning guilt. Remember, the majority of guilt from patriarchal distortions is conditioned. It doesn't mean there can't be some natural guilt. But that conditioned guilt will then have us atoning and, you know, powerless, letting others have power over us. When you have Uranus new phase, Pluto, regardless of signs or houses, you're, the soul's trying to break free, Uranus, from all the old conditioning factors. Uranus, decondition, liberate. And we have Uranus in the mini generation of Libra right now and or in this chart and the eighth house. So this is telling us, well, this soul 12 degrees away from Pluto, Uranus, well, they've had perhaps some prior experience of trying to break free from some of these old conditioning relationships. There's still some levels of codependency here. There's still some... Uranian conditionings that I need that relationship and that I need that lover. Now I will say in the EC, environmental conditionings of this soul, as she has moved through relationships, she finally was able to get into some more shamanic type relating and have some deep emotional bonding as well as standing up for herself. So in other words, right here, She's been making progress more and more and more of recognizing how she's got to break free. She's got to have the freedom to go through these experiences. She had the reader, Reader's Digest Convention version, as I like to say. And so, but yet she's starting to get more and more aware, breaking free from the aspect, new phase. That yes to that type of person, no to that type of person. Feedback from our volunteer. Am I describing things correctly or for what's going on for you right now? Or this lifetime? Are you recognizing this Uranus Pluto phase? You have to unmute, sweetie. Um, yes, you know. Um at many times I've kind of thought that it's better to just go it alone because it's so much pain with relationships, too much pain and too much burdens. And I, you know, I had also this pattern of, of falling in love with people I cannot get close to for some reason. Actually, I'm still in, in a part in, in that situation. So, yeah. 
We'll look at that. I have yeah. this. I'll bring this into the picture for you. Yes. And, and yes, with an ink house, Pluto, you've got to go over and affect the self-reliance. And we'll look at this, too, as we explore your chart um, together. And while it's not always stated, there, are, there will be time periods, especially when a Scorpio soul is learning to affect self-reliance, that you will have those time periods of celibacy or those time periods of learning to have that relationship with yourself. Mm. And, you know, so... Yeah. I very much finally understand. I have to love myself. Um, that is coming more and more clear. And yeah, especially the, my in, inner feminine part, you know. I, yes. I d define myself as androgynous, but maybe I kind of haven't fully accepted the feminine, the, my inner woman, the inner, so, some, some, some part of my femininity. I really cannot... I, I need to embrace that and love that more. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, with this Uranus new phase, Pluto, you know, what's also new and, and coming out of the womb, so to speak, is with Uranus in Libra, your liberation is to learn how to be in relationships from that equality. Okay. And so, again, the abusive relationship that you described, you yourself said you didn't stand up for yourself and eventually you had to due to the abuse. And it set you on a path as you moved forward with more intimate relationships of learning to get a little better, a little better, a little better, standing up for yourself for fairness and equality. Would you say that's accurate? Yes. Step yeah. by step, I'm learning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we all yeah. we 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 all are, and I share Pluto in the eighth house with you. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> when yes. they're done, then. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we could go on. I have to give brief examples, and so thank you all for allowing me to do that. But again, burning questions. You're more than welcome to. Um, uh, stand up for yourself. Let me just quickly check in with volunteer. Um, a question with what we've described here. Uh, we'll use both of these planets as example as we go further through the chart, okay? But burning question or anything? Mm. It's okay. Okay. No. okay. No. All right. If something comes up and you're muted, get a pen and paper, jot it down quick, okay? Okay. And that way, and that way, um, we, you know, it can, uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll still address it, okay? So, again, we're quick here. We're back, okay? And looking at this next phase, the next phase is crescent. And um, this is from 45 degrees to 90 degrees. Now, this is where we bring in the semi-square, and, of course, the sesqui squadrates. And you don't see these aspects in your little astrological calendars. However, I would highly encourage you. Um, volunteer, you may want to mute yourself, honey, because we can hear background. Oh, Thank you. No worry. No worry. I'll remind you to mute and unmute. Um, we don't see these in the astrological calendars. However, I would strongly recommend that you start to study these aspects because you think a first quarter square is frustrating. Try having a yang phase and go to yin phase. Try having yang go to yin. And that's what every single semi square and sesqui, sesqui squadrate does. Sesqui squadrate is square and a half. Where that energy is so used to moving outward that all of a sudden it has to turn around and go the opposite direction, it's very frustrating, and yet it's necessary. We can't just keep flying out into space. Sooner or later, that Big Bang is going to collapse back upon ourselves. Sooner or later, the sun is going to come collapse back upon itself and become a black hole. So here's how we get used to that back and forth energy hopefully learning along the way and evolving. So this is something to really remember 
when you're looking at these phases and then you try to bring in a specific aspect along the way. Now our next example is going to be a couple of degrees beyond the septile so I'm going to include it in this aspect right here. Um, you know, when you're doing sessions with clients, you don't always have time to go into every single little aspect. You've kind of got to go for the larger picture and then I like to just trust the details will follow through. However, you know, if you're practicing astrologer, however the client asks the questions, you know, if you're studying your own chart, by all means, try to work with some of these little detailed aspects in your own chart. You know, we, we learn from our own example a lot. Um, we're not always objective with ourselves, but, you know, we do get our feedback right here all the time going on. So remember, crescent, gibbous, disseminating, and balsamic are always energy coming back in that creates a reflective energy. You could almost think of new phase, first quarter, full, last quarter, two steps forward, one step back. You could think of crescent, gibbous, disseminating, balsamic as almost being two steps back, one step forward. I've got to reflect before I can go out. I do not mean to apply that one evolves and the other devolves. I'm just using example of more outward versus inward or more inward versus outward. Okay. So as any two planets together are then moving from that uh, new phase to crescent phase, anytime you've got real close to the semi-squares here, you know, 43, 44, 45 degrees, it does not want to slow down, keeps wanting to go out. But then when you get into this 46, 47 degrees of the semi-square, oh my gosh, it's just like they've been thrown in upon themselves and they can feel like nothing works anymore. I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to do it. I've got to ponder it. I've got to think on it. And so crescent phase is known as the struggle. They've got to They've got to, to, to hold on to whatever they've created so far. But now they've got to take it in and ponder it and see if they can manifest it or ground it. Can they create something that's unique to them? Venus, Mars, can they create a relationship patterning with someone else that works for them? Mercury, Saturn, can they f go within and listen within and learn to think for themselves and how they're going to take responsibility for their own world? But it's, it's a real internalization and pondering back and forth about this or that and how do I act and can I act? And so it requires a consistent personal effort between any two planets or a point and a planet. Almost always compare a point in space like the midheaven to a planet. You start with the planet and you go counter, no, you go clockwise, just like the nodes. Because if you, if you observe charts and you're off a few minutes, that's kind of how they go. I don't have a slide for that, but you can remember that one, okay? Um, but again, whatever two planets, and I'll just use that for sake of conversation, they really have to have a consistent effort here. Part of this is because what's opposite crescent phase is disseminating phase. And the key words for disseminating um, are, are um, society. And so it's, it's kind of like us against the world. And while we have that with new and full phase, okay, that yang energy of fight back. Whereas crescent with everybody else is kind of like, oh my, they're bigger than me. They know more than me. Oh my gosh, society has it all put together. That group of people has it all put together. That person has it all put together. 
they've, you know, and I'm still trying to put my pieces together from everything that I initiated from new phase. And so what can happen with, with crescent phase is it can slide back into the past or consensus. Any two planets all the way up to 90 degrees, they've got to get to 90 degrees and beyond or they can slide back to balsamic or they can go over and adopt what society says rather than doing their own individual way. Crescent phase is one of the most highly individualistic phases we have. And Jeffrey always used to say, I loved this. I didn't hear, I never saw this written in a book. Um, the waxing sextile, that 60 degrees that comes in the crescent phase, it's a half a trine. Choices made at the waxing sextile will last all the way around the rest of the 360 degrees. That's how important it is to individualize any two planets in crescent phase, regardless of an aspect. All right. So let's look at an example here. Now let's bring in Saturn, all right? Saturn is known as the individuated consciousness, that structure of consciousness that we all have. You can see on your screen here, our individual has Saturn in Gemini, two degrees in the third house, same archetype here. So here's a structure of consciousness that might sometimes be a little scattered, that might be trying on a lot of stuff, this would be an adventurer and an explorer, and there was a little bit of that background in her upbringing with her parents, so she was allowed to try this, try that, go here, go there. Sometimes with this archetype, you can try many uh, different career choices before you find something. Sometimes you juggle multiple career choices. You might have two or three part-time jobs. What we're going to do here for an example is Mercury to Saturn. And if you start with Saturn, the slower moving planet, okay, you go 53 degrees and 39 minutes, okay, 53 and a half degrees. Remember the septile was 51, what was it 5125? Septiles are the harmonics of seven. That means we take the circle and we divide it into seven pie shaped segments, not that eight, that's seven. And the septiles would always have what we call the element of fate to it. There's a septile, a bi, a tri septile waxing, a tri, a bi, and a septile waning, okay? And so septiles would, um, they're, they're, they're all of them, all, all, every single septile. It is an aspect where there is a realignment to whatever the evolutionary path is. It will sometimes bring in what appears to be that element of fate. Well, from EA, what appears to be fate is choices made in a previous life. Just like you will make choices in this lifetime that'll, that'll set up what appears to be fated this in a previous life. Well, Mercury, Saturn as a planetary pair. You know, this is the maturation of the left brain, our ability to communicate, our ability to process information. This is the maturation of how we are going to take responsibility for ourselves, okay? And how we are going to communicate out there in the world, how we're going to communicate with family, how we communicate with lovers, anybody. And so Mercury, crescent phase, to Saturn, all right, um, and Saturn is in, Mercury rules Saturn by sign and by house, okay, and here's Mercury over here at 25 and a half degrees Cancer, you know, let's just look at Mercury in Cancer's sixth house, you know, Mercury is in a water sign, it feels something before it can think it, verbalize it, and you put you combine cancer sixth house, it's like, oh, oh gosh, I said the wrong thing. 
oh, I, I can't speak up and say what I feel. You know, Virgo or sixth, sixth house Virgo starts to, you know, have doubts or have guilt that, you know, and so there's this, there's this, there, you know, both the signs, cancer, okay, well, um, cancer is passive um, polarity and Virgo is passive polarity, you know, so they're both kind of going inward all the time rather than verbalizing it. So just looking at that archetype. So now when you start to blend this together, see how I started with the planet sign house, planet sign house. Now you put it together through that phasal relationship, crescent phase, yin energy. It's going to add on to the passive polarity of these this um, house and sign, you know, so there's a, there can be a lot going on, Mercury sixth house, but I don't always have the courage, Saturn, to speak up and say it. I got to be pondering it. And she can sometimes adapt society's thoughts and conditionings about any certain subject. And so there takes an energy and a willfulness with her own mind to go through life and start to say, wait a minute, what do I think? What do I want? And if I may, bringing in this septile aspect, now Mercury's got two degrees beyond it, and you, start to, you can start to narrow the orb or the degree of influence with your minor aspects, okay? But I still consider two degrees to be close enough for um, a septile, all right? It can still have those people or events that will show up in our life at certain times and ding, put her career, Saturn, in a different direction or have her shift how she actually looks at her life and her world, how she wants to organize it, Mercury, Saturn, how she needs to communicate with others and so part of this evolution here is learning to find her own voice through all the emotions going on through the sixth house virgo self-doubt through the crescent phase i can't communicate as well as somebody else and if I may say, in regards to the career and finding her work with UBI, what I read through her ECs, um, a lot of social activism coming from a country as a Norway, she could be sparked here and find that courage to speak out um, for advocating UBI still highly individualistic for you know trying to say i get paid and i don't have to work you know and so she could be finding her voice in all these ways through that and surprise herself crescent phase how she's you know able to get that energy of what she wants to communicate out in clear and concise ways okay i can keep rattling on stop Volunteer and mute yourself. Um, is this is this <laughs> coming along okay? You following? Yes, absolutely. And um, I really recognize this nervousness to to take the place to consider to. Yes, that has been a struggle for me uh, in my life. Um, but I I easily uh, can uh, utter myself and speak when I work for others or champion other people's causes. That is very easy for me. Um, yeah, but there, there has been steps also there. How, and, oh, excuse me, I have a question, but go ahead. Yeah, uh, but when I started with the basic income work, um, I, I made my own lectures and I was totally scared to speak for people. <laughs> totally. It was, you know, uh, I would rather die, you know. Um, so, but I really wanted to talk about this because this was kind of so important for me and this should save the world in my mind. So mm -hmm. I kind of made this lecture that I was very happy with and I went into this conference and 30 people came 
and I envision myself as a radio, as a channel, a radio station, only as a channel. And I took my personality out of it. And I found that I could do it, you know. But I have a lot of, um, I have my, the Uranus is square to my son. And I have a lot of support there, I think, and, and other places. But, and I, but I do recognize this uh, challenges to, to speak up. And also maybe in, in groups like this, I, I, I don't really like to take the space for my own person. That yes, is. yes. And, and, uh, and I'll save the question because you just described the answer. You know, if you can, if you can find, you know, the, 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 the cause, you know, or the subject that, you know, you want to speak about, you find your courage. But for yourself and to voice up your own feelings and your own thoughts, sometimes that's more of that crescent phase struggle to do so. And yet, even in the eighth house, Pluto, intimate relationships, you've had the circumstances where you had to speak up. Yes, I was forced to speak in, in my relationships. Um, yeah. That's yeah. the septile. That's the septile aspect between these two coming through with the crescent phase. That uh, element of fate that I must speak or I won't survive mm. yeah all right i have to we have to go faster <laughs> okay i hope this is working for everybody um thank you for volunteering let's go into first quarter now most of you know first quarter crises in action you know this is where astrologers are starting to again recognize there's a difference between crises in action breaking free establishing the new self versus the opposite um square crises in consciousness or beliefs so this is back to yang and again key phrase crises in action now we've got to take that new evolutionary cycle between any two planets and put it out there again we've had enough crescent phrase reflection now let's go with it i am ready i am gonna put it out there now the closer we are past 90 degrees 91 99 39 you know it's it's it, it's just you know, combustion and, and, but there's still a little bit of that element of, oh my gosh, can I do it? But I've got to do it. And then as that phase starts to move through, it's like, you betcha I can do this. Watch me, you know, and we can just get somewhat full of ourselves in um, regards to bringing out their own individuality between any two planets and going forward. Um, Again, we start to overcome that fear of failure or sliding back. And yet, as we move into first quarter phase, there's still all those choices again. It's a lot more fine-tuned than the new phase, which was so random. Just put it out there, see what comes back from the universe. Here, we're a lot more focused. We, we kind of know how we want to bring those planets out. But we still have some choices relative to those two planets in what we're exactly going to do. And so we will play with those two planets a little bit to go, hey, I like doing it this way, but I don't know about that way. Um, first quarter phase, again, opposite is last quarter. Crises in action versus crises in belief. Okay. We want to do it. And yet, the opposite crises in belief, okay, everybody's been there, done that for us. It's still more of this everybody else, society knows better. And if we can get past that 90 degree aspect or that 95 degrees, then we can we can face that fear of going backwards. We can face that fear of everybody else doing it better than us. And again, as that phase goes along, we just keep going forward, going forward, going forward, sometimes to the point that we can, again, be quite full of ourself. Um I, 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 again, I don't feel that I have to explain so much with first quarter phase. Let's do it with example, okay? 
because people know squares. They know oppositions, okay? And so first quarter is about acting. It's about getting it out there. I want to manifest it. I want to see it be real in my life and in my world, okay? So here with our volunteer, we're going to going to oh this is where I bring in the notes and so I decided I'd put this slide in here rather than put it in the beginning and then have to help you remember it in evolutionary astrology um, I ran the Jeffrey Wolf Green School of EA for six years and I got Pluto Virgo one of the first things I did was everybody was confused do we compare the nodes to the planet or the planets to the nodes and so there were a couple of other um, EA grads that went back through the old, old message boards and how many, you know, what was the, what did Jeffrey say the majority of the time? 70% of the time he said, compare the nodes to the, to the planets. The nodes go clockwise. Most of you know 90% of the time the nodes reverse through the zodiac, so they reverse through the houses as well. So we're always comparing the nodes to a planet, okay? Nodes are points in space. I'm not going to take time to explain those beginners search elsewhere. So in this example right here with Uranus and the nodes, we're going to start with the planet, which is Uranus, and we're going to follow this inner circle right here all the way around to get to the south node and the south node is a gibbous phase opposition to Uranus it's less than 180 degrees if we look at Uranus and the north node we you can see it's a conjunction but it is new or balsamic you start with Uranus, you follow this outer circle, you've got to go all the way around the circle to get to the North Node. The North Node is balsamic phase Uranus. It reverses, it hasn't went over Uranus yet. So it's a balsamic phase conjunction that's quite tight. It's only half a minute. So the South Node is a half a minute from being exact opposition, gibbous opposition, the north node is a half a minute from an exact conjunction. Now, I do understand that sometimes when you start with astrology, it can be a little tough. But over time, with practice, practice, you get to see it visually. You just get to be able to recognize it. The other thing that we have in EA is what we call skip steps. And this is when we have a planet square the nodes or nodes square the planet, however you want to say it. I gave you three examples here to help you really get this. Again, see, we always start with the planet. In this example, I'm showing you Pluto over here. And you follow this red arrow reversing through the zodiac and the houses. And the first node you come to is the north node. This is the resolution node out of the skip steps of a planet bouncing back and forth in past lives. In this case, Pluto the soul, um, not really evolving the planet or Pluto rather than being it's, it's stuck in these nodes. So in this actual example, which is where this purple line is, the nodes are applying squares to Pluto. If this soul doesn't work on its skip steps in this hypothetical example, these uh, skip steps with the applying square will intensify. Pluto is 16 Virgo. If we had the nodes at 16 degrees Gemini Sag, it'd be an exact square. And if we had the nodes at 12 degrees Gemini, Sag with the green line, it'd be a separating square. Separating square would mean they may have had a past life already trying to work through these skip steps and they're on their way to resolving it through the resolution node. Just a simple example for you because in our next example here, looking at first quarter square, we're going to bring in the moon and the nodes. So Using what we said before, we're going to start with the moon here up at 16 
degrees Scorpio in the ninth house, and we'd start with the moon, and we'd start reversing through the zodiac, through the houses, and the first node that we come to is the south node. This is the resolution node. This is how the emotional evolution and self-reliance is going to evolve beyond skipping back and forth between these two nodes. Planets square the nodes, both south node and north node are active in past lives, all right? Um, moon's at 16. As we reverse back through the zodiac, as I showed you, if the south node was 16 degrees, it'd be exact. It goes all the way back another degree, 15. The nodes are separating squares. The south node is making a first quarter square to the moon. Again, I'm deliberately showing you an example with the nodes to go the opposite way around the circle. You'll have this recording. You can listen to it multiple times, okay? So this is a first quarter square. South node is first quarter square to the moon. Just to show you the example here, if we started with the moon, we could go all the way reversing through the zodiac and the houses to the north node. And the north node is a last quarter square to the moon. You can break it down to that much detail if you want to. When the resolution node is the south node, there's something about the past that that planetary archetype has got to go back and address. We've got to go revisit it and heal it to metamorphose the south node and really move forward then into the north node. When the north node's the resolution node, you're jumping ahead to go forward. Um, a lot more detail, but just a little example there. So, first quarter square, the south node has a crisis in action of needing to break free from some things about the past to evolve this soul's emotional self-reliance. Let's look at Moon, Scorpio, ninth house. Moon and Scorpio. Anybody know any Moon Scorpios? They, are, are, they can be very intense emotionally. They really do come out of the womb asking why on emotional levels. And because Scorpio is fixed water, sometimes they can draw emotional intensity to them to shake them up emotionally and help them make those metamorphic leaps emotionally to sometimes help them step up the polarity Taurus self-reliance in regards to that. Just briefly, with this moon square the nodes, oh, and ninth house, what can happen? Half Scorpio, half Sag. Moon and Sag, well, I don't want to deal with all that deep emotional stuff. I'm just going to run away. I'm going to move on. I'm going to go to the next adventure. Or that ninth house Sag compromising, I don't know if I can really address those emotions. Eh, that's not my emotional stuff. Uh, you know, that, that, that ninth house would just go into um, some of that... Um, Oh, the words are avoidance, you know, or compensate, you know, and not own up to the depth of what's going on emotionally or own up to the depth of their emotional codependencies. Because if you look at the nodes here in South Node 7th Leo, North Node Aquarius, if you look at these nodes, who will love me? too painful. I'm just going to go over here and be by myself. I don't need anybody. And there's, I mean, this, this just intensifies all the emotional intensity. And so when the resolution notice the south node, the bottom line is relationships. And the bottom line is to see themselves in a relationship. The bottom line is to be themselves in a relationship, Leo. The bottom line is to love themselves in a relationship through a relationship seventh house. And because it's first quarter and it's 
one degree. It's 91 degrees into that new phase, all right? So they can get pulled back into the past. What's the past going to be in this case? Oh, I'm just going to go over here and be by myself. No, you really are supposed to evolve and grow emotionally through relationships. And you've got to find the emotional courage to be honest with yourself emotionally, ninth house, and then really go look at all these karmic relationships that an eighth house Pluto will pull in, not to mention, remember Uranus new phase, pulling in those old partners with the codependencies and inequalities to break free. You're going to repeat this stuff, South Node, and the courage, first quarter, crises in action, is to do each one different, every relationship. Next, hello, lesson, goodbye, next, and to find that ability to love yourself strongly enough to demand the equalities there. That's that crisis in action that, you know, I've got to do this in relationships. I've got to figure out this relationship thing. I want a relationship. And so a lot of emotional courage is what I see here. And yes, then it's okay to go over and be by yourself and get a little emotional objectivity into the situation, okay? North Node, New Phase, Mars. It's okay to do what you need to do for yourself, that you can't isolate from relationships. You're going to evolve through them, and you're going to take the actions to do it differently emotionally every single time. Sorry, that was a, a, a volunteer feedback. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> you um, getting the you getting the flow? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you know, I really have struggled with this lately because I have my reverse return somehow here, and Jupiter has been over my moon and. I've been very, very emotional and very, very, I wanted to hide myself uh, lately. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the nodal inversion, it, let, me, let me interject just for people who are listening. Transiting south node is in Aquarius. Transiting north node is in Leo. She's just had a nodal inversion or a nodal opposition. The intent of that is objectivity okay when okay. when the nodes are opposite with each other you know we'll have a nodal return every 19 years and that's a rebirthing of our nodal energy when we have that nodal opposition by transit the the the, the major intent is to just learn to be objective. In other words, oh, I can look at that past, that south node, and transiting north node, I can decide how I want to go forward differently. Mm. Okay, got that? Transiting... I, strong, so I strongly feel I need to adjust yeah, my direction in life um, now. And, but I'm I'm feeling uh, this this moon, you know. I for, for the time being, I uh, <laughs> feel so sensitive and vulnerable, you know. Actually, I, I I've been nervous to stand up for on this program, even you know, with you here now. Oh, bless you. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm chairing this organization and. I'm I'm afraid to step forward and go out again. I, I I'm a bit so so. You think even beyond the intimate relationships, honey? Yes. Remember even in my work relations. Even yes. there, I'm very shaky now and very. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I I normally have some vision and you know I show some leadership, but for the time being, it is very difficult. You know. Well, some of that past, some of that past with this, with this signature, you know, is, is that it didn't always go well 
in front of people. So all those old triggers of speaking up are there. Okay, all those old triggers of being on stage are there. Mm. But that transiting nodal axis, that transiting north node over this, it's activating this south node first quarter square the moon. Yeah. It is facing that past. And it is finding the courage through the insecurity. Yeah. Okay. I also feel that I'm releasing a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. A lot of, mm -hmm. even, even it has been kind of stored in my body somehow, you know, yeah. I get memories up and they are released and but it feels like it's ne never ending almost, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel I don't have time for this, you know. I am, I'm, I want to go and do things. I don't have moon night. I don't, to, I don't uh, want to go to the emotional yuck. No, not really. <laughs> I don't have time. I have, I have things to do, you know, and it, it feels like that. So, yes, okay, yes. but I have to, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Facing. Facing this this past with whoever the relationships are with. I like to say the seventh house is all the relationships beyond casual acquaintance. Yeah. Yes, it's the dating game into the marriage eighth house. But it's also square the fourth. So it's family. It's square the tenth. So it's career. You know, so mm -hmm. it's there's a lot of relationships involved in the seventh house. So mm -hmm. You know, with this nodal transit, you can have a lot of stuff coming at you in all kinds of ways with relationships. Yes. But again, it's activating this first quarter square courage to act, to move forward. And what will happen then is this Scorpio moon will realize that it does have emotional courage. That it does have the emotional depth to stand up for truth and what is right. To do it for yourself emotionally and to do it in, you know, work or social environments and social justice environments as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's just good to say it, you know, it feels like, you know, just to, to say that I'm troubled, you know, I normally don't do that. So, oh, yeah, it's kind of releasing also. So, mm -hmm. and yeah, well, eighth house Pluto's in Virgo don't like being exposed. No. <laughs> okay. And neither does moon and Scorpio like being exposed. And so thank you for volunteering and being willing to share your chart with us. Thank you. Sure. All right, let's move on. I'm trying to quicken us up and save maybe even time for questions. And again, you're welcome to interrupt if there's a burning question on the board or anything. Um, and so Gibbous phase is from 135 degrees to the 180. Okay, and again, yin. So that shift right here of energy turning inward. All right. And so with Gibbous phase, you know, its key word is, you know, self analysis. We're coming off of that first quarter and we've We've gotten past the aspect, and as we've went through the phase of first quarter, we've gotten that courage. We've gotten that ability to manifest and put ourselves out there in whatever way that planetary pair needs to do it. And yet, we can't, again, keep going out. We've got to have a little bit of reflection. And when we get to Gibbous phase, the reflection is all about how does everything I've done up to this point now start to adjust into the other. And the other will start with one-on-one -on -one and go all the way through society. So any planetary pair is going to have to start to transition, okay, and go, wait a minute, I don't know it all. What is it I need to adjust or humble myself with to start 
integrating that original intent from new phase into, again, the other, the group, the society. I have to align whatever I think I want to do into what society needs, into what fits with the group. In other words, this is all the inner reflections we do in adjusting to recognize that I'm not an island unto myself. I have to learn how to interact with others. Yes, before I needed that courage to get out there and do it my way. Now, my way has to integrate with multiple ways of doing things. Um, the Gibbous phase, okay, its opposite phase is balsamic, all right? And so part of this humiliation, confusion, I don't know how to adjust, I don't know if I want to surrender, the opposite balsamic phase is the ultimate surrender to source. And so Gibbous phase can, you know, it doesn't want to completely let go of its own self-identity, but it can learn from balsamic phase in what is the ultimate way that I can be of service to society. And then I can still have some um, individualistic expression it's still the first half of the circle which is self okay I'm still gonna have how I want to express however can I ask what is the ultimate way to help with however I want to express myself and so as we again learn to let go of the ego and become ego, what is that, ego concentric, I think is the term, then we're going to continue to evolve our personal expression. It's just, it learns, it's learning how to get all along. It's learning how to show up and play in the sandbox with others. And so a lot of times what will happen here, and I'll, I'll bring in one aspect because, um, uh, I, I, my example is doesn't have this aspect. You hear of that within the gibbous phase. There is um, the waxing in conjunct, the 150 degree mark. Okay, and you know this is where we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between wanting to bust out, but the universe comes at us and forces us back in upon ourselves. Now you know why waxing in conjunct is internal adjustments, gibbous phase, yin phase, energy moving back. And so we'll remain at that waxing in conjunct between any two planets until we've had enough of that internal reflection and back and forth and we're ready to go forward, okay, I can adjust this to society. Okay, I can stand up for myself here as I adjust this within society till we get closer and closer and closer to that full phase. Stay tuned. We'll come back to that, um, or we'll get to that with another example. So next that I, the next one that I want to bring in, we're going to work with the moon again here. And they're in gibbous phase together, but there's not an exact aspect. They're 164 degrees. Saturn is the slower moving planet. We're two planets again, so we're going to go back to going counterclockwise through the zodiac, through the houses as we're used to going. And But we're going to get beyond that 150 degrees, which would be one Scorpio, okay, we're all the way to 164 degrees, but we're not over here to the opposition yet. Moon, Saturn, gibbous phase. Now, there's a lot we could say. Moon is the more nurturing parent. Saturn is the more authoritarian parent in today's world. Sometimes it's the opposite genders. It's not always related to traditional genders. Moon, Saturn as a planetary pair. 
is how we are evolving our own emotional self-image and maturation maturing into society distorted moon saturn i don't want to grow up okay um wounded moon saturn you know i can be in totally emotional shutdown and denial you can start to bring in the signs and the houses as you um look at everything and how you're working with it but for any soul individually moon saturn is the emotional maturation process so that we can become a fully functioning adult in the world whether it's through career whether it's through being a parent whether it's just through relating in an intimate relationship um, so let's just move into some um, example quickly with this soul you know we had worked a little bit here with the Saturn you know structure of consciousness right here and you know here's a structure of consciousness that it has a lot of curiosity to it and remember the early environmental conditioning she was raised in nature both parents raised her to be um, adventurous to be open-minded um, volunteer I forgot to ask you this were there are there siblings were you born with siblings yes I have two younger siblings yeah uh, brother sisters uh, yeah brother and sister sister eight years younger to me and I'm the oldest one okay the brother two and a half years younger to me okay okay all right all right get along with both siblings yes we okay. are pretty much a happy family so okay <laughs> thank you thank yeah. you <laughs> well obviously you know saturn and gemini third house I, that's you know hey are there siblings <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. again, <laughs> structure of consciousness here is more aligned towards, for the most part, open-mindedness, curiosity, exploring, you know, juggling multi multiple thoughts. If there was some woundedness here, it would be either circular thinking, scattered thinking, you know, not being able to focus um, on anything you know could go uh, you know different ways in regards to that but if we look at this moon in this gibbous face to um, uh, um, Saturn from your descriptions I don't really see you you give me some feedback you know sometimes it will just outright explain mom and dad if both parents were there were there were were they at cross purposes to each other any because gibbous phase is you know those adjustments did you did you have that with mom and dad um no they were very uh, coordinated as parents mm -hmm. um but they were very different you know um it was my father who was mostly this you know exploring person my mother was more kind of very practical and not very mot motivational Kind of, so I was this kind of that that is girl, you know, um, mm -hmm. following mm -hmm. his ideas and exposure. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we went out and looked at the world and did things, and he was, they were very handy, practical, uh, and we did a lot of work together, builded things, houses, fishing, did a lot of, mm -hmm. yeah made food <laughs> fish traditions um yeah we did a lot of practical stuff really yeah so here's where we have to have that observation correlation because sometimes if you would see moon you know give his face to saturn you might want to assume that mom and dad were like you know always trying to adjust to one another and yet feedback from you know the volunteers know this wasn't the case yeah, and maybe they i know they they have tensions between themselves but they hide it it's 
you know so with, that's with yeah that, that, so, <laughs> that was yeah. my next comment yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was there but <laughs> not on the surface yeah <laughs> the arguments, the arguments came when the kids weren't around yeah. no. <laughs> but, to look at you with your own moon, you know, to look at this with yourself, can you see how we're, we're still building on this picture, even coming off of south node, first quarter square, the moon here? Can we see within yourself how you're going through your own internal adjustments to your own emotional maturation process? Sometimes your Saturn structure of consciousness with you know, this double Gemini flavor doesn't always want to have to emotionally ponder and look at things. You can go to that ninth house distortion of wanting to gloss over it or, you know, compensate in some way. But yet there's a tuck here between these two planets, gibbous face, that pulls you inward emotionally that says, I've got to look at these emotions that I have. I've got to look at any wounds or hurts and pains and upsets. I've got to look at why I emotionally explode. I've got to look at how to address my own emotions better so that I can continue to move forward into the world more and more whole on emotional levels. Am I describing this that you can understand how these two planets are functioning together? Um, I'm not not sure. Do you, do you say this is that this position is hindering this to happen? There's no good or bad. No. Okay. Astro evolutionary astrology doesn't work with good or bad aspects. No, no, but but there is some kind of tension and difficulty in this maturation. Yes. Process. Yes. I, yes, I can yes. confirm that. I, I really never, well, I, I didn't want to be grown up as the other. I want to stay as a child, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, in the night. <laughs> I, I, I like <laughs> to avoid responsibility, kind yes. of. You know, I like yes. to, you know, yes. be happy. And yes. so there is some tension. I, 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 and avoidance also to go into these emotional things that I actually, but yeah. It hasn't come easy, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I had have been forced to to go into it, kind of. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. You know, while a Scorpio Sag Moon is going back and forth and back and forth between freedom and deep emotions. All right, that that this phasal relationship is always kind, at least with the maturation process emotionally, it keeps drawing you inward, gibbous face to look at deeper meanings to why you feel the way you feel. Okay drawing you inward to look at any moon and Scorpio codependencies, moon kind of, you know, mm -hmm. relating to an eighth house Pluto here, okay? Drawing you inward to find your own personal emotional truths for you. Yeah. And then being able to have a maturing and a freeing up when you are emotionally honest with yourself. Yes. And yet the gibbous phase, again, adjusting to the emotional maturation process, all right, so that you can move into intimate relationships from a healthy, equal perspective. That's what that gibbous phase is moving towards as well. Okay. Kim Marie. Sorry. Yes. Uh, sorry, it's Linda here. I have a question mm -hmm. if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, go um, on. Um, I'm thinking the Saturn, would that be a tendency to suppress the emotions? And the if it's a um, givers phase, which is like Virgo, mm -hmm. uh, a healing crisis mm -hmm. of suppressing the emotions, um, does that make any sense? Um suppressing the emotions can come a little bit from the Virgo phase, but relative to this natal Saturn signature and 
in Gemini third, it would be more running away from the emotions. Yes, and I see that Mercury is in Cancer as well. Mm -hmm. Which, so I'm thinking, what about suppression with that Saturn? The, 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 the Mercury, well, we remember Mercury was crescent phase to Saturn, you know, so that was a yin phase. The moon's a yin phase to Saturn. Both of them draw the energy inward, okay? The, this, the, the Mercury to Saturn would bring in a lot of um, analyzation, okay? Um, I, I see where you're, you're, you're coming from Saturn in general suppressing, correct? Yes. 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 There will be some of that. Okay. But again, you have to look at how Saturn is by sign and house. Okay. These are both active polarity and they're mutable modality. Okay. And we've got the air element. Okay. Double signatures by sign and house. None of those really lend themselves to deep suppression, okay? Mm -hmm. They lend themselves to all that mental air activity. So, it. so it's like, again, it's the flighty thinking. It's a structure of consciousness that doesn't follow through on something. I'm just going to go on to the next thing. I'm going to have the next conversation. I'm going to have the next, you know, activity. And yet, Mercury is pulling Saturn into deeper reflections. The moon is pulling Saturn into deeper reflections by, you know, virtue of their signs and houses. So rather than not to say that there isn't any suppression, because we're all going to have a degree of Saturn suppression, okay? But this is a lesser degree just by virtue of Saturn sign house. And the signs and houses of uh, crescent Mercury and gibbous moon lend themselves more to internal pondering, thinking, emoting. And so there's, there, there actually is a fair amount of growth that could come from that if she's willing to be psychoanalytical gibbous phase, okay, especially on emotional levels because it's moon gibbous phase Saturn. And Mercury and Cancer, you're almost, you can almost get some of that same repetitiousness in there. Is that, is that helping? Is that helping? Very, very much. Thank you, Kim Murray. Thank you. Oh, you bet. No problem at all. Other questions? Anya, are you following? Yes. Um, this makes sense, uh, what you're saying here with my scattered thought, thinking and, mm -hmm. you know, not following up and a lot of ideas. I have mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, sometimes but, well, I recognize my patterns now, but I have had done a lot of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those my yeah. ideas and notes and you know yeah <laughs> piles of it yeah i would say when you get too emotionally confused that exercise or walks in nature you mm. know that's how this saturn calms down that's how it calms down you, you know for you because there can be so much mental activity here to just go have a physical activity or if my may be a blunt enough to have some sexuality in there, either self sex or shared sex, you've got to have an emotional release because even in the gibbous, the gibbous phases are yin to so that mm -hmm. moon to Saturn. It's yin. It's got to, it's still got to, it still builds up to having to have some release from that yin phase mm -hmm. and Scorpio builds up, you know, fixed water. It builds up, emotional energy anyway that has to be released some way yes okay i i'm watching time i've got um half the zodiac to go or half the halfway through Whew, see um i'll try and go faster okay but um hopefully this is working for all of you okay full phase of course it initiates the second half of the zodiac you know, it brings what we initiated at the new phase into meaning or completion. 
Now, it can be problematic because we can be equally divided between opposing forces, wanting to be free and independent, and wanting to start initiating ourselves into relationships. And so it can create that inner opposition where we want to go into isolation. Oops, excuse me, there's the isolation. Or we want to go into um, social interaction and immersion. Okay, so again, I want to be free. I want to have a relationship. I want to be with somebody. I want to be alone. You can see how that goes back and forth between the zero and the 180 in regards to um, aspects. So what can happen when we go into the social immersion interaction side of it, we can feel overwhelmed again because everybody else's values, needs, desires are stronger than ours, are more important than ours. We get so enmeshed in the relationship, we lose a sense of ourself. That will draw us into the social withdrawal. That we then have to separate ourselves from someone so that we can find our own self perspective again. But when we get too caught up in the withdrawal and isolation, we don't have any feedback. So we don't have anything to grow with. And so then we want to go back into the relationships. Now, when this is distorted, we go from the extremes of isolation to the extremes of relationships. And when we go through those extremes, we pop into the next relationship that comes along versus using some of that full face discrimination. And so what we need to do is to balance both the social withdrawal and immersion. This will allow us to then actualize into society and whatever we are doing on an individual purpose between any two planets, it learns how to socially integrate. So honor the instinctive need to withdraw and honor the instinctive need to socialize and when it comes in a healthy way, we go back and forth. I want to be with you. You know, I need a little bit of time for myself. I've just got to integrate some things and then I'll come back out. And it's not the extreme or one or the other. It's that ability to go back and forth. Okay. Now, if it's on the gibbous side of the opposition, that feeling less than is going to be a little stronger. If it's on the full side of the opposition past 180 degrees, we've got to get ourselves out there. Both before 180, after 180, go back and forth. Okay, and as we get to that 180 and beyond, yes, we can put ourselves out there, but we've got to be able to balance it equally, or we're going to get to the waning in conjunct, which is if you want to follow zero to 360 with the 12 signs, the waning in conjunct 210 degrees is zero Scorpio, and somebody more powerful or something more powerful will come out. Waxing in conjunct, 150, zero degrees. Virgo is inner analysis. Waning in conjunct, 210, zero degrees. Scorpio, natural zodiac, is outer adjustments. People will keep coming at us if we're too full of self and full face and not really honoring and learning how to balance into that equality and fairness. That is what we're supposed to do in full face. So the opposite is new phase. And so there is an old egocentric energy that's going to be released in some way. You always hear when two planets are opposite each other, something has to be thrown off. The throwing off is some, it's, it's the final shedding of the gibbous, you know, and full phase or the Leo egocentricness into equality so that that individual purpose finds a way to be fully productive in society in a fair and balanced way with you and others, with you and whatever you're wanting to create. So how many people have a Chiron Uranus opposition in their chart? 
<laughs> I'm doing a series on Chiron in Aries, and um, uh, there were 41 Chiron Uranus oppositions. There were, uh, let's see how fast I can find this little sheet of paper. Yes. Uh, there were 41 Chiron Uranus oppositions. There were 27 Saturn Chiron oppositions, 1986 to 2006. Only three Chiron Neptunes in the late 90s or late 80s. And there were 11 Chiron Pluto oppositions in the 1960s. Almost every single one of us alive on planet Earth have Chiron in opposition with either Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto or multiple outer planets. So, 41 Chiron Uranus oppositions between 1952 to 1989. And it goes through half of the zodiac in regards to signs. Chiron Uranus as a planetary pair. Chiron is that rainbow bridge between Saturn and Uranus, individuated consciousness, individuated unconsciousness. Chiron is trying to help make whatever's unconscious conscious in order to heal. And if you think of Chiron as the wounded healer, healing the wounds to turn him into our talents and gifts that we then express as a healer to help facilitate others' healing. You look at Uranus being the sign of the trauma that's under the surface for each of us. Isn't it amazing that there are so many of us that are born with Chiron Uranus oppositions in our chart right now on planet Earth? Are we trying to full phase or bring all that trauma up to the surface and throw it off? And so we're all having to throw off our wounding in whatever ways our ego may be trying to stick to our story you know it's my it's my trauma it's how i know you know the wounded part of myself well how well can you throw that off and say i don't need that anymore and that for all intents and purposes that's what we're trying to do now if you're born with chiron in the gibbous phase or the gibbous phase opposition aspect to uranus you're a little more on the wounded side, Virgo, okay, making excuses why you can't heal the wound in some way or why you're clinging to the story in some way, or if there's some natural guilt in some way, you still have some atoning to do in some way. You know, a variety of stories, but there can be a little less courage. And again, please don't hear words judgmentally, okay? There's just a little bit less energy to throw it off, give his face. Oh, I don't know if I can do it. Whereas if Chiron is, uh, is past the 180 degrees to Uranus, I want to heal this. I'm tired of it. I want to throw it off. I want to get rid of it. And yet that wounding, as we're at that full phase and moving into it, We've got to make sure that we're not trying to run a new story that my trauma is bigger than your trauma. You know, I need you to be in my life to heal my traumas. I don't know if I got time for yours. There has to be an equal giving and sharing in that whole process of healing trauma. Another thing that can happen with full phase as we're looking at this Chiron Uranus aspect, can we accept help from the other full phase in healing that trauma that we want to release and let go of? So I'm, I just find this, these Chiron Uranus aspects fascinating in charts. I just, I, I, to me, it's hopeful. I don't care whether it's gibbous or full phase. We want to make trauma conscious. We want to make all the patriarchal wounding and distortions conscious. We're coming in at the end of the Piscean age and we're wanting to just move through it and be free. So this 
particular charting question, we've already discussed some of the relationship wounding and trauma, perhaps some of the codependency. Coming off of new phase to Pluto, Uranus may be a little bit on the um, less than side of the equation and learning to step up to the equality. Um, Chiron is, hold on, do, 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 do. Chiron is 184 degrees, so it's four degrees past the opposition here. And so this means that there is a real push pull here. Chiron in Aries, okay, leading up to your Chiron return here in a couple of years, volunteer. Lucky you, congratulations, you are going to break free, you are going to find these deeper levels of self-reliance, you are going to learn how to feel equal to everybody else, whether an intimate relationship or not. You know, um, Chiron and Aries, uh, um, you know, sometimes we'll keep create that key phrase for Chiron, the spiritual warrior. When it travels through Aries, well, sometimes Chiron in Aries is the wounded warrior. I tried to break free before and it didn't work. And so I've got to find my courage again. And any of you who natally have Chiron in Aries, that's what you're going to be doing as you have your Chiron return in a nutshell. You're going to find your courage to really break free. And you're going to find that ability to be a healer again. And so, again, I'm trying to get a lot of stuff in really quickly. I would say that this courage to be yourself, okay, and then be yourself in relationships is probably one of the biggest things that's coming through for you volunteer on in full phase in regards to this. Let me stop. Let me get some feedback from you um, quickly. And have you, have you worked with your Chiron Uranus opposition any? I mean, yeah. just under, understanding it astrologically or therapeutic work. No, not really therapeutic work. Um, I'm 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 not educated uh, astrologer or but but I, I'm I'm trying to get to using this to understand myself mainly. I haven't really done any hard work to to process things, mm -hmm. but but I've seen that you know also my son is in square to both Chiron and oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so but that I, I just recently discovered that and it. It, it really mean, makes so much sense, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, also yeah. that, that the Chiron is in the second house and, and I have a struggle with income and, you know, mm -hmm. together with my identity. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, at the same time, I've been working with the basic income, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to get money for nothing, kind of. So I, I mm -hmm. have had a lot of, of problems with that. Chiron and I'm very aware of it, you know, and mm -hmm. it has been very difficult. That is also something I'm, I'm, I'm trying to handle now. Yeah. Have you been dependent upon previous intimate partners for income or to help provide for the household? Mm, yes, the, my partners has been the kind of main providers uh -huh. most of the times yes uh -huh. yeah 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 so that's one of the areas where you have to work through and breaking free mm -hmm. you know not only Ari chiron in aries you have chiron in the second house so there's woundedness around self-worth mm -hmm. so what's underneath bringing income is feeling worthy of the resources and on the ultimate level, the second house is recognizing the ultimate resource that everything comes from, which is source itself. And that's one of the things you could be opening up to. Now, because you mentioned it, and you're correct, I'm someone who doesn't like to put all the aspects lines in there because I, you know, it just gets a little, a little too much. I like to go like this when somebody's talking because then it, it, it comes through. Um, sun, Chiron start 
Sun is a crescent face square to Chiron. Whoops, I clicked my button. That emotional courage. Emotional courage to heal and create because of the wounded warrior, so to speak. If you start with Uranus, you go all the way around the zodiac and the sun is a last quarter square to Chiron. So we'll work with this crisis and consciousness belief, the last quarter square, um, in just a little bit and we'll, we'll, we'll tidbits on that um I, I you know there's there's not only the issues around resources going on here the issues around woundedness around sexuality that can be going on here but also the issues and woundedness around intimate relationships and a lot of it i would say is you being able to be essentially who you are you know chiron uranus for all of us in that opposition is breaking free to be be who we essentially are. Think about that. What's the greatest gift you could give yourself to be who you are? And that's what Chiron is trying to liberate with Uranus. So you're trying to do it. There's an extra emphasis with Aries and second house, you know, to be me and to value myself and live a life that I value versus all these lifetimes of how did I have to be to get along in a relationship? Mm. You know, the Uranus and Libra mini generation can be those karma chameleons. You know, I can, I can play any type of partner you want me to play so that you will love me. Mm. Uh, can you break free from that one and be yourself and love yourself enough so then that the the, the, the full phase is going to be two people who are essentially who they are, freely loving each other and can do it in a committed way. That would be some of the goals for you with this yeah. Chiron Uranus opposition. I could just keep going and going and going, and we got to keep going. <laughs> Thank you for letting me speed up as we tend to do. Disseminating phase. Another yin phase, 225 to 270. This phase is called society. And, and sometimes people are like, how does that turn out to be society? Shouldn't that be the, you know, 270 to, to, to 300, which is Capricorn? Um, if, you, if you look at the second half, going from one-on-one -on -one to then bigger and bigger and bigger groups, okay? And we're understanding bigger groups, okay? And then what do we have to share with bigger groups until we let go of the groups and come all the way back to the ultimate group, which is source itself, to rebirth into ourself again. It can take a little bit of time to work with this, okay? And that's okay. You play with it with your own chart, okay? What what you what you would want to think of is when we're working with yin phase here what this means is we want to learn society here we, we we're learning how to have a relationship with many people with our one-on-one -on -one intimate partner now we're learning how to break out into groups of people we're learning to want to understand how society functions and how society operates here and then when we get to the last quarter square we're so full of society and yet we still have to function in society and not only that, we still have to function in society when we get to balsamic phase and all we want to do is be alone. So let's look at this a little more. Disseminating phase. As I said, there's an ongoing socialization of whatever that original evolutionary intention was back in the new phase. Now we want to know, as I said, everything there is to learn and know about how society operates. We want to understand it. 
Think of that Sagittarian right brain philosophy. And before Capricorn can have rules and laws, we've got to have the philosophical or cosmological foundations of society that condense into the rules and laws Sag to cap as you follow zero to 360. So this is where we want to learn and understand rules, customs, norms, etc. And the reason is we want to bring that um, individual or that evolutionary intention. We want to bring it out into society as fully as possible. We want it to be integrated into society. Now the opposite of dem disseminating phase is crescent phase, all right? So what can happen here is it's possible that we can lose that evolutionary intention into society. We can get too caught up in what society's norms and uh, philo philosophies are, and we need to be able to remember why we want to put this individual purpose into society. So if we become lost, that opposite crescent phase will remind us of what we struggle to create on that individual level in our world. So here we're going to look at Venus and Pluto. And they are 269 degrees. Pluto's slower moving. Start with Pluto. You go all the way around the zodiac. And we are one degree shy of last quarter um, aspects or moving into last quarter phase. So we're not only looking at the culmination of the disseminating phase here. We are on the disseminating side of a square, of the last quarter square, okay? So it's actually a square aspect, but it's disseminating yin phase, not last quarter yang phase. What is Venus-Pluto as a planetary pair where, you, where we start? You know, this is the self-reliance of the soul. This is the evolution of the soul's value systems. This is the evolution of how we give and receive in relationships, that outer Libra side of Venus. And so Venus, Pluto, if we haven't evolved into meeting our own needs, Pluto can have a controlling energy to any other planet it is involved with. Insecure Pluto especially wants to control and usually, you know, try to have some power over. Sometimes insecure Pluto gives its power away and does the power less. Pluto Venus can go back and forth with that. As we look at this from the perspective of a disseminating phase, this is a soul who on some philosophical level, disseminating phase, knows that it's up to her to meet her own needs. She even can know how to meet her own needs. She may have conditioned to give that away, but when you're reaching that, that three quarters of the way around the zodiac, you've been through society. You understand a lot of how society works. And so what is deepening for her is to really be able to create whatever she needs, to take care of her own needs, and to minimize what she wants to project another to do for her. Now, disseminating phase, what, the, what can happen here with that crescent phase polarity is that she can give up on meeting her own needs and again, want someone else to do it or settle what for 
what for what society says she needs when polarity crescent phase what does she need what do i need and so in essence what this venus pluto relationship is saying from the disseminating square is you must remember what it is you value and need on the deepest levels of your soul you must meet that need or needs within yourself versus the old Atel's Pluto history of any codependency upon another person or even a codependency upon society. Now, let me just remind ourselves, okay, you've been quite involved with universal basic income. And again, as we head into this Aquarian age and so much of the modern world becomes automated, there's too many people for enough jobs to go around. There will be financial reckonings um, to realign this. And actually, I mean, the deepest energy of, of UBI, universal basic income, is allowing us to flourish and be creative as humans versus trying to figure out how to put bread on the table. Now, again, I'm not saying that you can't be creative, and I'm not saying you're not responsible for your own needs on an ultimate level. You are. But I got two flows going here. Do you understand what I'm getting at, volunteer? Please just continue. So Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I, I can continue. I can continue. You know, again, ultimately, you're responsible for meeting your own needs. All right. So let's look at, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So you maybe think that uh, <laughs> this says that I kind of, of like the society to provide for me through the basic income, kind of. I wanted to put a large, I, I want, I want to remind people of the bigger backdrop to, uni to, to UBI, okay? Because in our patriarchal distortions, our societies have conditioned us so much, you got to work or you don't get to eat. And, you know, why can we not have a globalization of society? Because in, in natural law, under matriarchal principles, the universe is abundant. We have more than enough food to feed planet Earth right now. We have more than enough resources for everybody to live in comfort. It's not distributed very equally right now. So from that broad backdrop, that's what I want to, to reinforce for people with UBI. Because we're so patriarchally conditioned. And there can be there can be listeners to to this pod, uh, podcast webinar who've never even heard of UBI. Okay, so that broad backdrop is what is coming for us as a global society with the ending of the Piscean Age and the beginning of the Aquarian Age. Now, having put that big backdrop in there, mm -hmm. there's a part of your soul. Venus Pluto that understands this so well okay Get a disseminating phase Venus to Pluto that that's your social activism trying to educate everybody this is how everybody can have their needs met this is how everybody can have basic food, clothing, and shelter. Oh, and when th that's met, then you get to go beyond the basics and you get to flourish. So we've got that big picture going on. And within that big picture, as we then personalize Venus to Pluto, perhaps a better way I could say it that it would be a little clear is relative to your eighth house Pluto and Virgo eighth house. And of course, the history of karma in intimate relationships. You may have come through lifetimes disseminating phase in which you have allowed the other to become the one who is going to make you happy rather than recognizing you have to make yourself happy. 
Yeah, so it's two sides of this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is very interesting. Thank you. I have never thought about it. Mm -hmm. in that, that, uh, sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, you yourself could, you know, get a little confused if you don't understand that big picture of the whole globalization of society that's taking place and you know start to go oh gosh i you know maybe i better get out there and get a regular job you know so to speak and yes if you, that's where you feel creatively led to go or that's where you feel like you can express yourself crescent phase of polarity or that's where you feel like you can be of service to society venus yes but that's a separate vein from the karmic relationship history that's going on with your Venus Pluto. All right. How am I doing? Oh, gosh. We've got two more to go, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for hanging in there for those of you who are still there. <laughs> Last quarter square, 270 to 315 is yang phase it's the crises in consciousness or crises within our beliefs one of the things that happens with disseminating phase is i always picked up that saying by the time we get to the end of it is been there done that you know if you see somebody who has the last quarter phase that we um have looked at Sometimes they'll, they'll get into, oh, do I have to do this? I don't want to relate to society. I want to be by myself first quarter. And yet, as you can see, relative to this last example, no, you got to kind of work on this relationship thing. Yeah, you got to learn the self-reliance, but you still got to, you know, operate through relationships self-reliantly. You don't get out of relationships on planet Earth. Sorry. Um. And so as we get to that last quarter and then move into last quarter phase, you know, this is where we have the, um, the dissolving of everything that we've put together with society. And yet that works for the last 90 degrees of the circle. And so from 270 to 315, we still have to function in society as it no longer feels like it's serving a purpose. So it brings up that famous crisis over what's it all mean? What do I believe? And so this is where that Capricorn consensus comes in. Okay, and what's happened is as we've learned everything about society, we're going to go into the last quarter phase and either distort into the consensus conditionings or we're going to ponder them and say, I don't think I can do this. There's got to be a larger truth to this even more. I thought I knew the truth disseminating phase, Sag, but the ultimate or whole truth goes to Pisces. So we've now got to expand our understandings again through last quarter. So what we're meant to do is decondition ourselves from society and all of the consensus conditionings we also begin to culminate and complete anything within that planetary pair and that original evolutionary intent that we haven't brought to uh, completion or resolution that we haven't manifested. In other words, what's the exhausting desires that we haven't exhausted yet? So we rebel against the consensus. And it opens us up to broader and broader universal truths, which are timeless. Now, the opposite of last quarter phase is first quarter. So there can be a continued loss of ourself if we cling to all of society and its consensus values. If we embrace that crisis in consciousness or beliefs through last quarter square, 
then what happens as we open up to universal beliefs, we still have a function as an individual. We still have a function in society. We're not married to society as much anymore. We're, we're not yearning to understand it. We've got that. But we still have to be a part. We have to participate on planet Earth. And we have to start to learn how to do it in our own individual way. So fulfilling un, um, any desires that are not fulfilled yet between the planetary pair and to broaden their understanding more and more and more beyond society, and then to remember how will we function individually in the broader picture. And so here's the Sun-Pluto as a planetary pair. And their degrees are 284 degrees. So the last quarter square is 270. We're about 15, 14 degrees beyond it. So Sun is um, last quarter phased Pluto. Again, you start with Pluto, you go all the way around the circle till you get to the Sun, counting the degrees, and you're in a last quarter phase. All right. And so, yes, this is in the T-square here. We'll try and bring that in. Oh, I forgot this. Let's back up to last quarter. Sun was last quarter phase to Venus, remember? Or, or Uranus. Um, we just got off of Venus last quarter or disseminating phase to Pluto. Sun's actually last quarter phase to Uranus two degrees in, okay? We can look at both of these, one from each phase. Let's look at the creative self-actualization here. Sometimes I just say personality, creative life force. We have an interesting mixture of, smart, uh, 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 of um, Cancer Leo. Yes, they exist right here, um, fourth house, fifth house. Cancer, if it's not if it's not creating its inner emotional self-reliance, it moves into Leo even more insecure. It's what they call that emotional arrest in our development. And so there's a push-pull here. And if we look at some of the environmental conditionings that came through from the family, um, the childhood upbringing was, you know, um, relatively normal <laughs> okay <laughs> she's agreeing <laughs> what happened when I grew up <laughs> eighth house Pluto <laughs> and <laughs> actually my parents they all repeatedly say they were normal you know <laughs> we are normal so but I never felt normal but they said so so yeah. very normal upbringing that's true <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand this, this sensitivity. <laughs> but you also, you know, you are, you're an interesting mixture of, I want to be free, I want to play, I want to be noticed, you know, I want to do things, and don't look at me. <laughs> I'm going to crawl into my shell, you know, and so that cancer would really go through the animation withdrawal, you know, and, um, you know, as you were younger, you'd just go off and play with, you know, the animals and the, you know, the plants and, you know, you go off and play in nature. As you grow, got older and, you know, this, this creative life force here, it, it, all of a sudden you got, you got, you got traumatized into intimate relationships. You know, you were, you were raped at 17 when you first started college. And that's a pretty tough shift from quote-unquote normal childhood. And all of a sudden, you go out into the adult world and boom. I mean, talk about a Uranus in Libra eighth house pendulum swing. You know, that's somewhat of, of what happened here. And so Sun 
is last quarter aspect to Uranus. Talk about throwing you into a crisis in beliefs. Wait a minute. Why aren't people nice, Libra? Why aren't they 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 um 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 respectful? Why why aren't you know why aren't boyfriends you know why don't they treat me decent? Um, why don't they understand my my sensitivity? I mean, this was a trauma. And again, those of you who have studied EA, you never assume that if someone's raped, they raped in a past life. You don't assume the karma. There's evolutionary as necessity. And basically, sometimes not so nice things happen to wake us up. Mm. And so that early experience and in intimacy really, you know, even though this is a yang aspect last quarter to Uranus, okay, it it threw you into that crisis of what is going on here and really had you start pondering relationships. And it probably threw you over to this first house trauma right here, okay? And it's just, you know, you could have done the classic fluff this. I'm not going to do relationships. You, as you said, it just was such a numbing experience that it led you into a lot of sexual activity, okay, in order to try and feel again. Mm -hmm. This could be the traumatization that would freeze up the bodies, not to, you know, multiple bodies, physical, emotional, etc. But this never stopped processing. Why is this happening to me? And what's it all mean? And why does anybody in society act that cruel? Mm. Now, sun, last quarter phase to Pluto, okay? It's more of the same. And yet you're starting to get a handle on it. It's almost like as you've went through this lifetime and you went through another intimate relationship and another one and another one, they eventually started to become less and less painful until, as you said, you were able to have an intimate relationship with someone who was of a shaman nature. There's still pain from the ending of that relationship, but you got to open up to go, to have a little more healthy intimacy in a relationship, okay? That experience of coming through the shock and trauma and trying to figure out what it all meant and why do we operate that way and then learning from that and going, there's more to this. This is not how people are in relationships. And as you yourself have been opening up and returning to your understandings of natural law, you know, this can also then signify eventually getting to a relationship with someone who could understand how sensitive you are. Am I accurate in this? Am I, can you, I mean, can you sense the journey that you've made in these intimate relationships? Yes, I, I do. Yeah. Mm hmm but how sensitive I am. Yes, I am very sensitive. Uh, Not that we ever get to the end of the journey, because, you know. But, uh, it sounds like there's hope now. <laughs> In a, well, I have had hope. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I, it, yeah. yeah. And one of the things that I, I, I guess one of the things that I try to do as an astrologer, and, and I have a lot of, I have a lot of Scorpio and Sag in my chart. So I dig deep, but then I try to say, and here's what we can do with it. So yeah. I always try to say, here's the distortion, and here's how we heal it into a natural expression. And I try to do that with any planetary archetype, in any sign, any house, and any aspect, in any phase. And if I, so I don't, I, I, again, with the client, I try not to assume and I try to say, well, here's the expression in a distorted way, and here's how it would naturally want to express. 
so you can you can you can um, kind of light the path, so to speak. Okay, and hopefully that's how that is um, um, kind of playing out um, as we've sat here with your chart for a couple of hours. You know, I think with this last quarter phase, you know, you're going to continue, as you continue to work on the polarity self-reliance, all right, this continues to metamorphose into more and more self-empowerment and self-healing. Virgo and then this allows this last quarter phase Sun to work with naturally expressing itself and allowing its sensitive creativity to find healthy ways to express an in intimacy and find healthy ways to express out into the world yeah. including second house you know that ultimate self-responsibility self-reliance how do i create with myself excuse Understand? me kim marie huh? yeah excuse me kim marie and anya we have five minutes left one more one more face okay <laughs> Phew. i keep looking at my clock but i can't i can't say that i've been very good at timing all this stuff so okay la uh, balsamic phase is yin and of course, its keywords are spirit and ideals. And, you know, this is the last 45 degrees of the circle in which all of the original intent has to come to completion. And so everything that we started a whole cycle ago, anything that is unfinished must be experienced, must be manifested recreated so that we can understand it so that we can bring any karma to a culmination so that at the new phase conjunction we can start all over again all right and so balsamic phase it's like you have to have one foot on the ground in the world and one foot in the sky in spirit so you you really do and, and again the closer and closer it gets to the balsamic conjunction the more frustrating it can get to handle that Jeffrey said the balsamic conjunction was one of the most frustrating aspects to have because you've been through everything and you sense what's coming after it but you've stuck finishing some stuff up. And so you, again, you've got to walk that karmic path as you want to be free to start over. So just like in new phase, you wanted all that freedom to just bust out and go. In balsamic phase, you've got all that ultimate responsibility. One of my key phrases for Pisces in 12th house Ultimate freedom means ultimate responsibility. What Jeffrey Green would say on the absolute level, there is no victimization. And so we have to just have this ability to surrender, let go and let goddess, not from victimization, but from co-creation. What do I need to do, source, to heal the karma, to finish it up, to be allowed to move on? And that's what happens with this phase. Um, here, the consciousness between those two planets will become very internalized. And yes, you can have all the self-contemplation that you want because it allows you to effect upon the nature of universal reality or what we call timeless universal principles, especially in especially relative to the two planets involved or the planet and point involved and how they really would operate on the broadest, most natural levels. So balsamic phase opposite to gibbous, okay, this is where we really learn how to go back to being of service to, the, to another person. And this is how we learn to go back to service to source. 
and we have to put that universal awareness into action. We're cleaning up all the karma between the two planets and we're learning how to put it into action. Now, my phrases that I like to say, balsamic phase and um, Pisces 12th house, what would you have me know, source, question mark? What would you have me do, source, question mark? And you ask and ask and ask until source reveals it to you. So here we are with Jupiter conscious beliefs, Neptune unconscious beliefs in a balsamic conjunction, three degrees. While Jupiter's in Scorpio, digging psychological deep to every why in her life that she has experienced in this lifetime, it's in its own ninth house. Neptune is zero degrees Sag in the ninth house. Both these planets are retrograde. She is accelerating the process of throwing off a gazillion lifetimes of patriarchal conditionings and distortions. The Neptune at zero degrees is opening her back up to understanding these natural spiritual laws and principles. Please hear me. I, I do not mean this from a better than, less than perspective. But what are we attracted to? Hmm, let me get emotional. What are we attracted to evolutionary astrology for? Because we want the truth. We want to return to natural law. So that's, in essence, everything of what this is opening up to. Oh, and by the way, let me point out, Jupiter is a gibbous opposition to the Saturn and Saturn is a full phase opposition to this Neptune. Look what grounds this scattered structure of consciousness. There's a nice thing here. I, I, this to me, I don't see these as bad oppositions. This is what's giving you grounding even deeper than Saturn. So you're going to have a Jupiter return here. So you want to spend this Jupiter time period and Jupiter three times over your moon. You can really be doing a lot of contemplation of everything we've talked about through this webinar, you know, and everything you want to heal and, you know, understand and break free from emotionally, you know, as EA always says, you know, spirit and flesh are two sides of the same coin. You can't separate the physical and emotional bodies from the mental and the spiritual, which is what the religions have tried to do. And as Jeffrey Green would always say, evolution takes place through the emotional body. And so if you can learn to understand that every experience you've had in this lifetime has been about bringing you back to emotionally healing with source, emotionally healing with the universe, you can really be the spiritual rebel and rabble rouser <laughs> as you, again, continue to go to your deeper understandings. Now, if we look at it from that perspective of what needs to be culminated, where's the unfinished karma? For, as it goes with many of us, but you can see it here through all the Sag stuff, you will go through the disappointments with um, how people function and operate in society. You know, you don't have to be in that religious world on a detailed level, but you see the effects of the distortions of patriarchal societies and religious distortions you see all the effects of that so you go through your spiritual disappointments mm -hmm. and how well can you put one foot in front of the other when you are spiritually disillusioned jupiter balsamic neptune understand that that makes sense 
Absolutely. Where have you, you could have had your lifetimes relative to the codependencies here, okay, relative to the moon, square the nodes as we start to bring everything in. You could have had your lifetimes where you compromised on your beliefs for security. Mm -hmm. So you may be experiencing some insecurities in relationships or without relationships to return you back to what are your natural beliefs versus the conditionings you bought into. Okay, Kim Marie, fantastic. Thank you so much. We you are welcome. We have to oh. stop here. That was yes. absolutely awesome. And Anya, thank you so much. We've all learned an incredible amount today. And thank you from all of us. And we'll see you next time. Just excellent. Awesome. Thank you, Kim exactly Marie. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. Every, every Wonderful. piece of equipment that we have. Um, I you. You're welcome. You're so most welcome. Find the whole kit and okay. <laughs>